Good afternoon. Um, it's time to begin our regular halacha shir. Uh, the topic that I want to address today is kavana in tefillah. Uh, uh, how much you? How much are you supposed to engage your 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 mind and your neshama while engaged in prayer? Before we come to that. Let me ask you if you have any questions of a halachic nature that you wish to begin with. Hi, Shalom Rafik. Oh, hello. I wanted, wanted to know um, this idea of fasting after uh, the Chagim on Bet and Hay and Bet. Mm -hmm. um, why would that make sense to occur in Tishrei? And why would that make sense to occur during the Omer? During Nisan, when you we, both months, we wouldn't say Tachna. Well, the um, uh, fasting first. First of all, that the fasting you are speaking about is not obligatory. Uh, the fasting you are speaking about, Bahav, three days after Yom Tov, the fasting you are talking about is a, a lovely minhag, commendable, praiseworthy all kinds of good things, but in no sense obligatory. Now the question is, why is it a good minhag? That's your question. And, and there, there are a number of answers, but the primary answer is that every fast day is primarily an issue of tshuva. Uh, that's what every fast day is primarily about. And... Uh, uh, after the Yamim Tovim, it doesn't particularly matter which Yom Tov, after Yamim Tovim, when we had a mitzvah of Simcha, there's always uh, some fear, some chashash, that the Simcha might have gone overboard and turned from a uh, spiritual Simcha into, um, into an undesirable uh, physical one. And therefore, some tshuva might be required for that. So, so the, 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 this is the origin. This is the reason for fasting to do tshuva if the yom tov was not properly was not properly observed. It, it's it's a, a lovely minhag, uh, uh, not widely followed, not widely practiced um, nowadays. Oh, you don't know about this. We no longer live in the Middle Ages. Well, some of us no longer live in the Middle Ages, but you know, back then, uh, people did not have a lot of food to eat. Um, if you uh, visit the, the Tower of London, you can see the, uh, uh, the, the armor, the plate armor that the knights used to wear in the Middle Ages uh, on display in the Tower of London. And you'll see how small in stature those knights were they they were very small people well well uh, growing up they just didn't have much food uh, and uh, and indeed you see this nowadays uh if you look at the immigrant Im the immigrant generation in israel those coming from places in the world where they just didn't have much food to eat. Uh, you look at the immigrant in, in, uh, uh, generation and you look at their children who were born and grew up here where we have abundance of food. So, you know, the parents are very short people and the, uh, and the, uh, and the children turn out to be very tall people. Well, 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 um, uh, uh, back then, when there was barely enough to eat in any event, there was not a big difference between fasting and not fasting. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't such a big deal. And therefore, uh, people used to fast far more frequently in the course of the year than nowadays. Now, we're all spoiled and uh, uh, accustomed to eating so much, it just makes it more difficult for us to, for us to fast. Okay, that means we have to find other motivations that means we have to find other drachim other paths which will lead us to tshuva okay is that enough about fasting okay any other issues but one uh, yes one wouldn't would wouldn't be a problem to do it in tishrei or in Isan. correct correct no problem okay any other halach any other halachic issues that should be addressed uh uh, before I begin the topic for today, 
Okay. Um, well, yes, I wouldn't yes, mind. Yes, 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 I Jody. It's unrelated to anything, really. Um, Every, everything is related to everything. Thank you. That's okay. true. A woman um, after she's given birth. There's a different status, 24 hours, 72 hours, one week. Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. Uh, as far as fasting and Yom Kippur is concerned, this is... No, uh, Shabbos. Ah, as far as Shabbos. Well, the, the issue is as follows. Um, uh, giving birth is a life-threatening event. Uh Back in the back in the old days, uh, before modern medicine, the, the death rate was fairly high in in childbirth. With modern medicine, Baruch Hashem, the death rate has plummeted. But but unfortunately, there still is there still is a death rate in childbirth, and therefore, every labor and delivery has the uh, not only the halachic status but has the reality. Of being life threatening, and therefore it's correct to be machal Shabbos. It's correct to do whatever you have to do in order to minimize the threat of labor and delivery. Uh, that's why it's correct to call up an ambulance or drive yourself, have have someone drive you to a uh, to a hospital or someplace where it'll be safer, safer to give birth. Now, now um, uh, the question is. When does this status begin, and when does it end? Uh, the, 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 the status of pre presumptive threats to life, therefore not only permitting but encouraging violation of, uh, of Shabbos in order to lessen the risk, begins when the tzirim, the contractions, are so strong that a woman would not be able to stand up by herself. She might want to sit down. She might want to lie down in earlier stages of labor. But when the labor when labor reaches the stage that the tzirim, the contractions are so strong, she's unable to stand. That is the point in time where the where the halachas of pikuach nefesh, sakanat nefashot, threats to life. Uh, come into come into play, and it's uh, correct to do or whatever. Then, and of course, of course, every case is different, and some women in some situations might uh, have threats to life much earlier in certain with certain medical complications. It depends upon the facts. If in fact there's a, a threat to life earlier, then of course you'll violate Shabbos or do whatever is necessary earlier. But but even if it's the most normal routine labor and delivery with not the slightest reason to think there are any complications then the status of uh, life endangerment begins when the when the um, when the uh, contractions are so strong now uh, the uh, well, when does the status end well well of course every case is different and some women might have uh, serious medical issues and uh, the status of being in life-threatening condition might might go on for a long time but in the routine uh, labor and delivery where there's no reason to think there are any complications so as you correctly point out for the first 24 hours after giving birth the uh, presumption of being in a life-threatening situation continues and therefore it's correct to violate Shabbos or whatever in order to reduce the threat. That's for the first 24 hours after giving birth. Uh, for the next week, well, back in the old days, um, uh, what, what the Mishnah and Gemara say, or back in the old days, uh, once the 24-hour period has elapsed, uh, you have to ask a mumcha, a uh, professional, a midwife, uh, uh, a physician, someone who's uh, uh, who's uh, who's an expert and experienced in childbirth, ask ask their opinion. Is this woman's life in danger? Similarly, ask the woman herself. Uh, and if either the medical professional or the woman herself says there's some danger here, then all the leniencies are in place. But someone has to think that she's in danger once the first 24-hour period has elapsed. Either 
the uh, medical professional or the woman herself. Halev, Yodea, Marat Nafsho. Only you know how you feel. And therefore, if the woman herself uh, feels that her life is in danger or the medical professional uh, 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 says that, either one justifies violating Shabbos. Okay? Yeah. Let me add one more important point. Mm -hmm. Postcom are divided on the following issue. When we come to violate Shabbos in life-threatening situations, are we to minimize as much as possible the violations of Shabbos, or do we uh, does Shabbos just vanish from consideration and we treat the uh, we treat the situation exactly as we would during the weekdays? As far as this is concerned, the majority of poskim hold that Shabbos simply vanishes when dealing with life threatening situations, and therefore there's no need to minimize violations of Shabbos, just do whatever you would do uh, during the week. Uh, the minority of poskim are strict on this matter, and uh, if uh, uh, it's not burdensome, if, uh, if you can do everything you have to do in order to, uh, to, to deal with the medical uh, situation using a shinui or minimizing the violations of Shabbos, well, that, that's good, that's praiseworthy, that's, that's commendable, that's advisable. But uh, if you do not have the presence of mind uh, to minimize the violations of Shabbos, uh, if you're just too, uh, uh, too, too nervous uh, to think about these matters, well, me'ika uh, hadin, the fundamental halacha is in accord with the majority, large majority of poskim that you just do whatever you would do during the week in order to deal with the life-threatening situation. Okay. Well, uh, Thank were, you. were there other aspects of this that need the discussion? Sorry? Okay. That's it. Okay. Uh, are there other issues now before we get to uh, Kavana in Tefila? Oh, yes. Oh, oh beautiful. Beautiful. I don't know if I, I don't know if everyone sees the sees the <laughs> that was unintentional. The, the special effects. Okay. If I do this, I'm have, it I'm, will. I'm, oh, I'm going to have to ask one of my grandchildren how to do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now I, I'm going to talk about the, the, to feel about davening. Now, normally in my classes, I uh, always present both sides of a machlokas. I always present divergent opinions. Sometimes there are more than two opinions. I, I, I always try to survey the opinions of the principal. As far as kavana, intention, spiritual energy in tefila is concerned, uh, there are two basic opinions. Uh, there's the opinion that, uh, and we'll see in a moment the sources, there's the opinion that tefila, davening, prayer absolutely demands spiritual energy and uh, the sources for this idea we'll see a few of them they go on and on and on and on and on forever and i don't see any need uh, to emphasize the importance of kavana in tefila since everyone knows how important it is what i want to do is emphasize the other opinion of the postkin now here come the sources. I just give a click on share. Nothing happens. So oh, then it comes. Voila. Okay. Here goes. I begin with the Yerushalmi. Uh, these sources should have been sent to you by email. I hope they arrived. Uh, and uh, as with uh, all of my sources, I don't bother to tell you exactly where I draw the sources from because you have that exactly uh, on the screen. If you want to look up my, typogra my typographical errors, which are legion. Here's what the Yerushalmi says. Amar of Chaya, Rav Chaya said, Ana min yome lokavis. I never had kavana while praying. I just uh, never, never, just was never been able to do it. Ella Chadzman Boy Machavna. 
once I want to really make an effort, and once I wanted to really have kavana in tefillah. You hardly believe me. I thought in my heart that I should direct my spiritual energy to the prayer. But I mean, I said in my heart, man alel kume malka kadai. In the etiquette of the royal court, who is supposed to enter the chamber before the king? Who comes in to announce that the king is about to arrive in the chamber? Is it the Aksva? Is it the, uh, the officer uh, who's uh, uh, appointed? Or is it the Reish Galusa himself? who's supposed to come in and announce that the king is arriving. The one time I really tried to concentrate on the tefillah, I found my mind wandering, uh, wandering, uh, contemplating the rules of etiquette in the royal court. <laughs> Even the one time I tried to have kavana, I failed. Well, uh, that's interesting. He was a great rabbi. Shmuel Amma, another one of the great rabbis, said, Oh, Anna, Mani Sefrochai. Uh, when, when I try to concentrate on the tefillah, I find myself counting sheep. Well, not exactly sheep, chickens. I find myself counting chickens. I, I too have this problem. I'm unable to concentrate on the tefillah. I just find my mind wandering, counting chickens. Rabbi Bun Bar another rabbi said, Ananis, when I try to focus my attention on davening, I count Tibusaya, I find myself counting the rows of bricks in the wall in front of me. I'm davening, facing a wall of bricks, and I find myself counting the row of bricks. I, can't. I, I, I too, fail to concentrate on the words of prayer. So here we have great rabbis in the Yerushalmi teaching us that... Um, they, despite all their efforts, they're unable to have kavana, unable to concentrate on the words of the prayer. My favorite is, is Rav, Ma, Rav, 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 Rav Masnia. He said, Ana machzik tivu. I am grateful. I am grateful. Lurashi, to my head. I'm grateful for my head. The card havalamodim. Because when in prayer I reach modim anachnulach, hu karamagarme, my, my head bows down by itself. I'm so grateful for my head that it knows when to bow down. I, I have no idea where I'm in davening, but uh, uh, at least my body knows the correct time to, to bow down. <laughs> uh, uh, not a whole lot of kavana going on here. Uh, uh, not a whole lot of spiritual energy in the prayers of these great rabbis. And these were the great rabbis then, you know, like uh, uh, back in the days when the greats were really great. Well, uh, let's see what the poskim have to say about this. But I begin with the Shulchan Aruch. It says, that these are the words of the Shulchan Aruch. Lo yit palel b'makom sheish davar shemivatel kavanato. You should not daven in a place where things are going on that are going to distract you. Find a place to daven where you will be left alone and where you will be able to concentrate on your prayer. Placing yourself in a location where things are going on that you're going to be distracted, you're not supposed to do that. Uh, and don't choose a time to daven when your mind is occupied with other things. Uh, uh, you, you, you're uh, 
uh, you're, you're a lawyer, you're, a, you're an accountant, you're a businessman, whatever you, whatever it is, and the deadline for whatever is coming, whatever it is, is in your life, the deadline for the contract, the deadline for taxes, whatever, the deadline is coming and your mind is so occupied with uh, everything you have to do in your business affairs, that's not the time to carbon. Well, uh, Shulchan Aruch makes it perfectly clear that not only is kavana important, but kavana is so important that you must plan your time and place of davening so that you will be able to concentrate on the words of davening. But then the Shulchan Aruch continues, and this is the next sentence in the Shulchan Aruch, Achshav, nowadays, nowadays we don't care about any of this. <laughs> nowadays, we, we, we just, nowadays we don't care about choosing a time and place for davening where, you'll, where you will be able to have proper kavana. Well, why do we not care about this nowadays? Nowadays, we don't have such kavana in tefila, and therefore, it's okay to dive in a place where your grandchildren are going to be running around. Nowadays, it's okay uh, to dive in, in, uh, in the central square in the city where people are going to be disturbing you all the time. Anyway, anyway, you're not going to have any kavana in tefila. What difference does it make? Well, the Shulchan Aruch has now codified this idea that we learned in the Yerushalmi. Uh, the Shulchan Aruch has codified this idea that, for all intents and purposes, kavana is hopeless, uh, and, and therefore we cannot be so concerned with it. Let's take a look at another passage in the Shulchan Aruch. The passage in the Shulchan Aruch says, you have to have Kavana throughout the Shmon Esrei, throughout the Amidah, in each of the 18, or now it is 19, Brachot. The Bishnu Brewer says, the Kavana you have to have is the meaning of the words. Words are coming out of your mouth when you pray. You have to mean what you say. Uh, you have to understand the meaning of the words in the prayers and your kavana, your intention, should be focused on the meaning of the words. If that's too much for you and you can't work up the energy to focus on the meaning of the words throughout the Amidah, throughout the silent prayer, throughout the Shemon Esrei, at least have kavana in the opening, the beginning of Shmona Esrei, the bracha of Avot, uh, Avram Yitzchak Yaakov, at least have kavana there, uh, because that, uh, the Mishnah Brewer says, is the great shevach, the great praise of God, and uh, uh, therefore in the opening, the, the first lines of, of uh, the bracha, the first lines of the tefillah, you should not uh, allow your thoughts to wander and think about anything else. Not only that, you should have kavana through the whole of the tefillah, if you, but if you didn't even have it in the first bracha, even if you did have kavana in the rest uh, of the Shmon Esrei, kavana is most important in the first bracha, you have to daven again. Failure to have the Shulchan Aruch, Paskins, that failure to have Kavana means you have not fulfilled your obligation and you have to daven again. How is it possible? <laughs> How is it possible that we've seen all these sources according to which Kavana is more or less impossible? And nonetheless, the Shulchan Aruch seems to say that if you don't have Kavana, you've not fulfilled your obligation. You have to daven again. Well, daven again, and you won't have Kavana the second time. Uh, daven, uh, repeat the third time. You, you're still not going to have Kavana. What, you, you're supposed to repeat Shmona Esrei all day long? Hopelessly. Hopelessly. 
uh, looking for uh, for some energy to have a kavana. Is that what he's supposed to? Is that what he's supposed to do? Uh, the Ramo explains, Ha'idina. Nowadays, ain't chosrim bishvil chesron kavana. Nowadays, this halacha, which requires repeating the prayer, if you prayed without proper kavana, nowadays this halacha is lifted. Nowadays we don't do that. Why not? What good does it do to repeat the prayer? You didn't have kavana the first time around. You were counting sheep or counting the counting the number of rows and of bricks in the wall in front of you. You didn't have kavana the first time around. So you're not going to have it the second time around either. So what good what good does it do to repeat Shmon and Esrei? Just skip it. Lama Yachso, why on earth should you should you repeat the tefillah? It was bad enough the first time that you failed to have kavana. We surely don't want you to do it a second time, a third time, a fourth time without kavana. Just skip the repetition. Well, uh, although. The Shulchan Aruch is clearly aware of the importance, the supreme importance of Kavana in Tefillah. Without the Kavana, the Tefillah is worthless. Nonetheless, the Shulchan Aruch is equally aware of the failure to have any Kavana, and therefore, therefore what? Therefore what should you do? Uh, if you can't daven properly with kavana, what should you do? Well, well, well let's see what the Mishnah Brewer has to say. Uh, you know, the, the Mishnah Brewer is divided into three parts. This is a quotation from the Bir Halacha, where he goes into deeper explanations on certain issues. And there, he comments on, on what the Shulchan Aruch said, Ha'idin ein chosrim comments on the words of the Shulchan Aruch, nowadays, even though you failed to fulfill your obligation of tefillah, nowadays, we don't repeat the prayers. Mechora, apparently, kavanato imsiyem ashmoner esrei v'lo kiven ba'avos. Apparently, what he's talking about, apparently what the Shulchan Aruch seems to be talking about is someone who finished davening took three steps back or is ready to take three steps back and realizes, oh, I davened mindlessly. My mind is not engaged. I, would, I contributed zero spiritual energy to the prayer. But if you're still at the beginning of the Shemot Esrei, and now you realize, oh, I'm just mindlessly reciting the words. Came under Mitzada Din Lo since halachically you cannot fulfill your obligation of prayer without kavana. Heach no brachot. How on earth can we tell him? How on earth can we tell her, someone who, in the middle of davening, who just finished the first bracha? realizes I've not fulfilled the obligation of the first bracha because I had no kavana, I was mindless, I was just robotically reciting the words, how can we tell that person to continue davening? This person is going to continue using many holy names of God. This person is going to continue reciting many brachot, all of which are halachically useless, halachically worthless, and surely it's just prohibited to do all that. If you didn't fulfill your obligation in the first bracha, how can you continue? Just because it's unlikely that repeating Shmona Esrei is going to be successful for you with deep kavana, with any kavana, mm -hmm. that's a reason to permit you to continue to the end of Shmona Esrei using God's name in vain and reciting brachot, mm -hmm. which are invalid. Uh, it seems to me all wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't begin to understand 
how the difficulty, this is the Mishnah Brewer speaking, Mishnah Brewer doesn't begin to understand how the difficulty of having Kavana somehow exempts you from the obligation to have Kavana. Just because it's difficult, that doesn't permit you to recite useless, worthless brachot, just because it's difficult does not permit you to use God's name in vain. Hello. But I found a bit of a justification for this from the Chayon. Chayon, as you know, is one of my favorite handbooks of halacha, uh, early 18th century Eastern Europe. Um, he implies, the Chayon implies, the Chayadim clearly implies that even though the prayer is invalid, even though the brachas that you're reciting are all invalid, still, you should continue reciting them to the end of Shmon Esrei. It's a heret, but I have a different idea. Shalom yamar odata klal v'yamtin alashatz. I have a better idea. Well, if you realize that your prayer is worthless because your mind is wandering, I know this would never happen to one of you, and of course would never happen to me, but we're talking about other people out there in the world whose minds tend to wander into fila, like the great rabbis of the of the Gemara. Of course, this is not you and me. We we have perfect perfect kavana every time. Well, maybe it's better to listen to the Chazorah Sashats. Maybe it's better to listen to the repetition of the Shemona Esrei as repeated by the Chazan. Yadchil ba'atzmo, dalo betfil le'kaimalan, ein motzi el ledafke mishenu baki. The function, one of the functions of the Shliach Tzibur, one of the functions of the Chazan, is to fulfill the obligation of tefillah for those who do not know how to daven. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the good old days, when all was right with the world before the ruination of modern technology, um, no, no one had sidurim. I mean, you know, the few, the small number of sidurim, the small number of prayer books which existed were extraordinarily expensive because they had to be written by hand on parchment and so forth and so on. Either you knew the prayers by heart or you did not know how to daven. And, and people who did not know how to daven, for them, the repetition of the Shliach Tzibur was instituted. You listen to the Shliach Tzibur, you listen to the and you say amen and you fulfill your, your obligation to pray. Maybe that's what everyone should be doing nowadays. Since anyway... You cannot fulfill your obligation to pray yourself because you're not going to have kavana. In oven, the first bracha, at least you should try to have kavana. If you fail, just rely upon chazor sashats, the repetition of the Shmona Esrei, uh, to cover you. Now, now you, you see that the Mishnah Brura is very unhappy with, uh, with the uh, halachic situation, the, the situation being we're obligated to do something that we're unable to do. Uh, uh, well, well, well. How, how can we? How can we? How can we make peace with this idea that we're obligated to daven and we're unable to do it? And Mr. Brewer has his advice, which you might or might not think is very practical. Let's see what other great rabbis have had to say about this issue. Here's a Sefer HaMorot from the High Middle Ages um, uh, from, the, from the south of France. He writes, If you are able to work up the Kavana, if you are able to focus your mind, you should daven. If you are able to focus your mind, don't daven. One of the great early medieval rabbis wrote, Wow, 
if you're not supposed to daven when you know that you are going to be distracted, why is everyone davening nowadays? Um, everyone is distracted. No one focuses on their prayers. Why are we praying? Uh, no one is having kavana. Everyone knows before they start davening that it's going to be a failure. <laughs> Everyone knows before they start davening that they're going to fail uh, to fulfill their obligation. It's just it's just too difficult. We don't know anyone who has kavana. Efsha, maybe, but those who have shown them, it's not. Maybe this whole halacha of requiring kavana applied to the earlier generations. Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, David HaMelech. Maybe it applied to them. Maybe they were able to have kavana. Maybe they had the spiritual energy for this. But nowadays, no one can do it. And therefore, Mutav shenit palel below kavana, mishenakor otol gamre. Nowadays, we're faced with a choice: either cancel davening, either don't daven because it's hopeless, or go through the motions. Uh, <laughs> well, he says mutav. It's preferable to go through the motions of davening, even though you're going to be distracted, even though your mind is going to wander, even though you know that your prayer is going to be a failure because you don't have the spiritual energy to focus on your prayer, even though you know that, still, it's better to go through the motions of prayer rather than telling everyone, just skip it. We don't want to eliminate prayer from the world. And therefore, although it's not the best situation, the best we can hope for is at least telling everyone to go through the motions of davening. And therefore, you should not skip a single tefillah. Shakras, mincha, maya, musaf, on the days when they're musaf, you should not skip a single tefillah uh, uh, even though it's perfectly clear that you're just mindlessly, robotically going through the motions and you, your head knows when to incline for a modem. At least you should try to have as much kavan as you can. At least try. But uh, uh, don't, don't skip the prayers just because you know that it's hopeless. <laughs> Still, you should at least recite the prayers. Well, well, well here, here in the High Middle Ages, in the Sefer Amorot, we already have the idea that there's some value. Not, not clear what the value is. He doesn't explain to us why there's value in it. But he does, he does clearly imply that there's some value in just going through the motions of prayer, even mindlessly reciting the words. Let's take this idea one step further. Uh, the Beis Elokim, written by uh, uh, one of the great uh, early modern rabbis from, from the time of uh, just after Gerush Sfarah, just after the expulsion from Spain. He says, Yo'il hadibur, just saying the words, dibur, just saying the words is useful, is effective, la'ame aretz, for uneducated Jews. Now, now, now think about it for a moment. Uh, we, we, live, we live in times not only of immense physical Osher, physical wealth, the, the shefa, the abundance uh, in uh, in physical wealth that we have nowadays, uh, the, the, there was never such a thing in the history of the world. 
food at the supermarket, and you will see what, what the abundance of food which uh, never existed anywhere in human history. And not only that, but uh, here in Eretz Israel, uh, you don't know about Eretz Israel. There's a Jewish state in the in the Middle East called the State of Israel, and their national language is Hebrew. And therefore, children growing up speaking Hebrew in the state of Israel today, when they open up a siddur, when they open up a prayer book and learn the davening, they understand the words. <laughs> they know what the words mean. Uh, this is very different from previous generations. Through the generations, uh, there were always, Baruch Hashem, educated Jews who understood the Hebrew language and understood the meaning of the words in tefillah, but we're talking about a relatively small number of people through the generations. The vast majority of the population in every generation until quite recently, the vast majority uh, were, were uh, illiterate and, uh, and understood vanishingly little Hebrew. Uh, in, 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 they were taught as children to recite the words of the prayers. They were taught as children to recite the words of brachot, but stop them and ask them, well, what do those words mean? Who knows? <laughs> it's, uh, it's Hebrew. Well, for Ame Haaretz, uneducated Jews who do not understand the words they are uttering, they don't understand the words of the tefillah, they don't understand the words of the bracha. They make a bracha, boy creates, before eating an apple, but they don't know what the word bore means. They don't know what the word eights means. It's just something they were taught to recite. The imlohaya dibur. All they have are the words. All they have are the sounds coming out of their mouth. Aside from that, loyo yotsumi, they feel a cloud. The words coming out of the mouth through the generations, when the people did not understand a word of what they were reciting, just speaking out the words, uttering the words, that was sufficient to fulfill the mitzvah of tefillah. Of course, it would be better with kavana. Of course, tefillah, with the, the power of tefillah, of course, increases according to the amount of kavana that you have, but minimally, just reciting the words is minimally sufficient. And even those who did understand the meaning of the words, a relatively small portion of the population, even those who did understand Hebrew didn't always have kavana, as we saw in the Yerushalmi. Lachem. Therefore, towards the end of the Shemona Esrei, we say, Ki ata tefilas kol peh. Say, God hears the prayers of the mouth. Well, uh, these people don't have prayers of the heart. Their heart is not, is, is not contributing anything to the prayers. Their minds are not contributing anything to the prayers. It, it's all just words coming out of their mouth. But God hears that. A Baruch who hears the words coming out of your mouth. Klomar, this means even though your prayer is only from the lips outward, no internal value to it. It's just the mere externality of using your lips to form the words. That's all it is. In a kavana you have in your heart, you have in your mind, no kavana at all, you're completely mindless and robotic. In his rachamim, in divine mercy, hears the words you are saying. Even though you don't know how to power those words with any kavana. And this is what it says in the verse in Tehillim. 
שומע תפילת עדיך כל בשר יבואו. God hears the prayers which are uttered to him. כי מצד שהוא שומע כל תפילה, God hears, הקדוש ברוך הוא hears the voice of prayer even without any kavana. Well, um, uh, here we have formulated a very clear idea that minimally one fulfills the mitzvah of prayer merely by reciting the words and HaKadosh Baruch Hu hears the words that you are reciting and therefore HaKadosh Baruch Hu will accept your prayer even though your prayer is lacking kavana. Let's take this idea a step further. Um, the sources we've seen up to now are from uh, before or from outside the uh, tension between the Hasidic rabbis and the Misnagdim. At this point, I want to uh, uh, look, at the, look at the issues that we've been talking about, both from the point of view of the Hasidic masters and from the point of view of the uh, Misnagdim, those great rabbis who were unhappy with Hasidus. I begin with the Nefesh Achayim, written by Rav Chaim of Olozhin, uh, one of the principal uh, misnagdic works of uh, Hashkafa. Let's see what he has to say about it. Afilu b'mitzvah tefillah, shenikri savod shabalev. The Gemara says, what is tefillah? Tefillah is avoda balev. Uh, serving God with your heart. What tefillah is all about is engaging your heart. What uh, the, the, the Gemara makes quite clear that that's, that's what tefillah is. Kavana. Nonetheless, limdunu, nonetheless, Hazal taught us in the beginning of Tractate Tainus, where it says, we serve God with all our heart. Im calls it, nonetheless, even though the Torah says, and even though Chazal emphasize that prayer is all about kavana salev, all about the spiritual energy generated by your heart, nonetheless, ha'ikar sh'tzarich adam lachtoch b'svatav, nonetheless, the ikar, the main point is, you have to pronounce the words. Tafka kol teva, every word. You just have to pronounce the words, from the text of the prayers. Kamosha Amru Chazal, like the Gemara says in Brachot, Chana, you know, the story of Chana uh, in the Sefer Shmuel, the story of Chana, she uh, went to Shiloh, the Beit HaMikdash was not built yet. Uh, she went to Shiloh to Davin, and Eli, the, the high priest in Shiloh observed her davening. And uh, it says in the verse, Rak Svatea Naot. Her, 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 her lips were working, her mouth was working. Uh, Eli, the high priest, saw her lips moving, saw her uh, uh, engaged in prayer. And boy, oh boy, was Eli unhappy. Eli, the high priest, was very unhappy with this lady, Hannah. And he said, after she took three steps back, he said to her, my dear lady, are you drunk? Uh, uh, you're just moving your lips. That's what drunk people do who have no kavana in prayer. Uh, my dear lady, what do you think you're doing? He uh, rebuked her. It's interesting, incidentally, the, the Chazal learned from Chana that the tefillah should not be so loud that other people can hear it. Just like with Chana, we have to daven very softly so that uh, other people, HaKadosh Baruch Hu hears, but the other people do not hear. I, I find it... Uh, I find it insupportable. I mean, it just, I have no explanation for the, this bizarre conclusion of the Gemara, but, but given a disagreement between 
this lady, this woman, Hannah, who daven silently, and Eli HaKohen, the high priest, whose job it was to teach Torah to Am Yisrael, uh, uh, Eli HaKohen Agadol, whose job it was to teach Torah to the Jewish people, thought that I was doing it wrong. And uh, but for some reason, beyond my capacity to understand, Chazal, in their wisdom, Paskin, not like Eli, they Paskin against Eli, and they say she was right. Um, uh, just imagine a, a, a conflict in thought between a, a woman and the Kohen Agadol, and uh, Chazal Paskin in the core with the woman's opinion. In any event, since the verse says that Hana was just moving her lips, Mekan, from this, we can conclude, we see from this that at least you have to say the words. But if it's only meaningless words coming out of your mouth, if it's only a robotic recitation, even though there's no engagement of thought, you're, you're, you're totally mindless, your heart is not engaged. There's no spiritual energy here at all. This is not the best prayer in the world. But still, it's true that this prayer, which is mindless and empty, devoid of any spiritual energy, will not be the most powerful prayer in the world. That's true. Nonetheless, nonetheless, the prayer is not totally useless. Heaven forbid. One does fulfill the mitzvah of prayer, even though it's totally mindless and devoid of any spiritual energy. Ki al kopanim, nafshel olam, because at least you've made an effort to join your neshama to the spiritual world, to the spiritual realities of creation. Uh, and and that minimally justifies your prayer, and a Kodesh Baruch Hu will hear you. Now um, he was one of the great uh, Ashkenaz misnagdic uh, uh, thinkers. Contemporary of his was the Ben Ish Hai, uh, the great Rabbi of Baghdad, was a contemporary of his. And I just point out that the Ben Ish Hai in his Sefer Torah Lishma says. Uh, uh, the same thing, the same conclusions uh, based on Zoharic uh, passages. So this is not only an idea of the great Ashkenaz poskim, this is also an idea which is embraced uh, by great Svartic poskim. Uh, continuing our survey of the Misnagdic rabbis, let's see what the uh, Gro, the Gaon Bevelna, had to say about this. Al tefila the regarding mindless prayer, she could goof below neshama. Mindless prayer is like a, a physical body without any spirit, without any, without any neshama, with no spiritual dimension. Well, regarding this, the Gaon of Chaim said, if the prayer is merely physical in nature. You're engaging your lips and your tongue and your, your organs of articulation. It's merely physical in nature, pronouncing the words. It's supposed to be like a Corbin. And, uh, well, well, your prayer is empty of any spiritual uh, dimension. How is it possible for your prayer to be like a Corbin? Your prayer is, in fact, not like a Corbin. 
an animal sacrifice. A cow, a crevice, whatever the animal sacrifice is, uh, is a living creature which has body and nephish. And if your prayer does not have both the physical component of reciting the words and the spiritual component, well, it's not like a corvin, and yet feel is supposed to be like a corvin. Nonetheless, nech shevet Oh, but there is one korban which is not an animal. There's a korban mincha, which consists only of flour and oil. It's not a living creature, uh, not an animal. There is no nefesh in the korban mincha. The Korban Mincha does not have a nefesh. It's only a physical thing. Well, if you do have successful Kavana in your prayer, then your prayer is equal in value to animal Korban. If you don't have Kavana, then at least your prayer is like a Korban Mincha. And let me just point out in passing, that Korban Mincha is a popular title for Sidurim. Uh, th since the beginning of printing, there have been many, many Sidurim out there printed under the title Korban Mincha. Well, you know, at least, at least when we print these Sidurim and get them into the hands of people, they, they will at least be reciting the words, which is in and of itself of value. Okay, uh, so so we've seen that these uh, ideas of the Gemara, these ideas of the great Rishonim, which teach us the the value, not the greatest value in the world, but the value of mindless robotic tefillah te while distracted. These are ideas which have been embraced by these misnagdik rabbi, I mentioned in passing, uh, Gedole, one of the great Sephardic authorities as well. Now let's turn to the great Hasidic masters. Rav Aryeh Frummer was his name. Well, since he was from Galicia, I suppose we should say his name was Aryeh Frimmer, uh, uh, wrote uh, as follows. If in the course of your tefillah, you were so mindless, you were so distracted, you skipped an entire bracha, <laughs> yeah, just imagine, you know, like he, 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 he or she doesn't doesn't remember saying this bracha at all. We probably just skipped it. Nonetheless, shliach tzibur the chazan mutzio. Nonetheless, you can be yotze with the chazan. If you skip the bracha, you are no better than those ame haaretz. No better than those ignorant uneducated Jews in earlier days who didn't daven at all because they didn't know how to. They just listened to the shliach tzibur. They just listened to the chazan and said amen. Well, if you skip the bracha, you're like them. You're, you're like the amayarets. And listening to the repetition of the Shemun Nesri and saying amen, that does the trick. Even if the bracha you omitted is something which is so vital that you uh, would have to repeat the uh, Shmon Esrei, even if you forgot it altogether. Just listen to the davening of the Shliach Tzibur, the repetition of the Shmon Esrei. Dino Ka'am Shabbat the Gemara makes perfectly clear that the Chaz, the Shliach Tzibur, fulfills the obligation of prayer, not only for those in the Beit Knesset who hear him and say Amen, but the Chazan also fulfills the obligation for Am Shebesadot, the working Jews who are out harvesting the crops. And since they're harvesting the crops, they have no time to come to the synagogue. They're not even physically present in the synagogue. The Chazan prays, is their representative, and they, the people, the workers in the fields, fulfill their obligation of prayer through the tefillah of the, of the, of the Chazan. Uh, and therefore, even if your prayer is mindless, you can still rest easy and know that um, uh, the, the chazan, 
the shliach tzibur is going to daven on your behalf and will fulfill your obligation. And he goes on to explain in a, in great detail that it's not necessarily the chazan in your synagogue. Since the chazan fulfills the obligation for davening, even for people who are not physically present in the synagogue, well, you who are unable to work up the kavana, you who do not have the spiritual energy to concentrate on your prayer, you, you will be um, covered by the greatest chazan besof ha'olam wherever he may be in the world. And surely somewhere in the world, there is one great tzaddik, surely somewhere in the world, there is one great uh, chazan who truly does have kavana, and it's his repetition of the Shemona Esrei, which will uh, be yours and fulfill and fulfill your obligation. Uh, that's the point of the Eretz Tzvi, and this idea is repeated uh, many times by the Hasidic masters. HaKadosh Baruch Hu hears the voice of prayer, even if that voice is not being powered by a kavana and the spiritual energy. Tov, with this I'm going to pause uh, for today, and in Yetz Hashem, we'll continue next week, and I remind you, number one, if you have specific topics which you would like me to cover, feel free to send me an email, and I'll do that. Number two, next week, we are... Uh, uh, Beginning next week and going forward, we're going to be meeting at 12 noon Israel time. 12 noon Israel time. Uh, and I hope you all realize that summer summer, summer time is ended in Israel. We don't have winter time. Okay. Any, any, is, issues, any issues or questions? That was yes. Exceptionally good news. <laughs> very good. Uh, thank you, Rafi. Appreciate that it. That was wonderful. Thank you. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. My pleasure. I presume this doesn't um, apply to to Ma'ariv because it's Derabanan, or is that not true? No, well, it applies equally to Ma'ariv. Sorry, I meant the, because the, there's the, no the, Ma the, the tefill of Ma'ariv is Minatora. There's just no obligation to Davin. Mm. Well. Wow. Oh, can you yeah. explain that? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, all prayer at all times is is minatar. Well, it actually, it's a little bit of a machlokas. There, there, there's some rishonim, like the Ramban, who hold that tefillah is minatara only be'et tzara, only if you're in in trouble, uh, then tefillah is minatara. Otherwise, it's always drabban. But uh, uh, that, that's not a widely held opinion. Tefillah is connected to korbanot and always uh, uh, of Torah status, and that includes Ma'ariv, which is Keneged, uh, Keneged HaEvarim, Evarim Alam is Thank you so much. What we should talk about sometime, maybe next week if you want, is the nature of the obligation to Davin Ma'ariv. After all, the Gemara says, Ma'ariv Rashut, Ma'ariv is optional. The, the nature of this optional uh, prayers perhaps deserve some discussion. Sometime, right. at some point, that we'll would be to wonderful. That. Okay, okay. Emir Hashem next week. Thank you so Tom, much. Look forward. Have, have, have a good week. I wish you a good week, a safe week, and eventually Amen. a good Shabbos. Amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Thank have a great you. start to your but over the winter. <laughs> Amen. A gesunden winter, a healthy winter. Oh, man, oh, man. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.